our second half of our program will be equally stimulating as the first half. Um, I was reflecting um, with the, the first half of the program, particularly as we were talking about you know, how do you engage people and how do you work them into the jobs that are underfilled. And one thing that I do know is so important as we were talking about education and the K-12 to education is vital. And we have to get kids excited about STEM or, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, that is so key because if they can relate with um, – this, like what that does in terms of a workforce thing, it really helps them to stay engaged in those careers and, and those fields of study. So we all need to think about that. And we'll talk a little bit about that, I believe, um, when John comes up with the Oregon Business Plan and the focus on education. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Wild. And um, Paul is uh, in customized training for Mount Hood Community College. And as we were planning this summit, we talked a lot about, you know, the need for succession planning and leadership planning and that type of thing. And Paul and I met, and one of the things that he and I talked about is this problem has been a problem for a long time. It just uh, kind of got couched in the, um, the recession. And as he put it, when 401K became 201K and less people retired, uh, extended their employment, and what have you, and then people were laid off. So the problem hasn't been as prevalent, but now uh, it's upon us. So Paul is going to walk us through strategic workforce planning for leadership succession. He has 30 years of public and private sector experience providing training services worldwide. He's had a couple stints abroad, I believe. And um, he has worked with more than 150 companies to design and deliver training. So with that, I turn it over to Paul and his capable hands and his presentation. Thank you. So I've been told always start a presentation with a surprise, and uh, my surprise is I'm not a millennial, um, <laughs> despite the appearance uh, to the uh, contrary. Um, I'm a boomer, just to give you th that uh, perspective. And, and as Allison said, uh, I've had the privilege of working with about 150 companies in this area, doing needs assessments, finding out about what their income worker training needs are. And you know, usually folks would come in, one of the first questions I'd ask them is, what keeps you up at night? And I noticed that was mentioned here earlier. Um, and then we'd go over what their needs were. And then we'd go through, visit their facility, find things out. Um, and one thing I notice is, for example, in manufacturing, a lot of the facilities, maintenance folks, 55, smoking, overweight, and no one coming in behind them. So I started asking folks, you know, what are you going to do when these folks are no longer in the workforce. How are you going to replace them? What are you going to be looking at? And most folks said, you know, that's, that's a long-term problem. My hair's on fire on this issue. Let's talk about it, you know? And so, um, so they never really got to succession planning. Then 2006 came around. All of a sudden, the boomers start hitting 62, 10,000 people a day start retiring, et cetera. Um, and then people started getting on the cusp of doing something. And um, we started building some, some, some you know, ability to offer services. And then 2008 took care of that problem. Um, and it's not an issue anymore. Um, but now that we're all recovering slowly, um, we're looking at this question of what I'm now referring to as worker mobility. I've sort of opened it up more. I focus more on boomer retirement. <clears throat> but then um, I was fortunate enough to start working with a guy at uh, Multnomah County called Steve Joyner, who's working with the county to address this issue. And he's saying, you know, OK, fine. Boomers are leaving. That's fine. They're going to be retiring, um, even though they don't think they're going to because they're never going to get old. They're never going to retire. Um, but there's also this issue of this work of mobility, millennials coming in and leaving. You know, what have you done for me lately? Stacey, that was a great talk. Um, and so I'm opening this up a little bit more. And um, I've put together a Prezi here that I hope works. The screen's a little small, so we'll see what happens. Um, and so we'll just start off with that. There we go. Work and mobility. My focus today is really going to be more on the idea of solving problems. Um, what can you do about this? Because a lot of times when I was talking with folks, the, the question I got was, OK, I understand, but how do I move forward? And it became a lot of what, what I refer to as one of those imponderables. I understand it's a problem, but it's too big. I really can't deal with it. Um, I, have these, you know, I have these targets I have to meet today. I don't have time to deal with this long-term problem. The immediate is more important 
than the important. You know, that's what you get focused on, especially if you have quarterly um, targets you have to make, et cetera. So my idea is we're going to quickly go through this idea of there are things you can do in the short term that can help lead to a more strategic response to what's happening. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about also is based on the work that we've done together with Multnomah County in, and thinking through this very strategically. Um, and so Steve Joyner couldn't make it here today. Um, he sends his best, but he's actually doing this work uh, with Multnomah County, and it's working more quickly than he thought it was going to. So his apologies, but he'd love to be here. Up front, let me let you know what my take-home points are. Um, essentially, worker mobility, it's out there. It's a threat. Um, it's a strategic threat, and you need to respond at a strategic level. Second point, the solutions are out there. There is something we can do about this. So, you know, this is something I, I borrowed from uh, the, the Sloan Center over at Boston College, this whole idea of awareness, assessment, action, okay? Awareness, that was taken care of. Um, this call to war, uh, I mean, I think Stace did a great idea, Best did a, did a great job on this, so I'm not going to go through this too much, but mainly what I'm going to be focusing on is, look, there, there are ways that you can assess what the situation is measure what it is, get, get an appreciation for it more than just being scared to death, um, and then that can lead to some sort of purposeful action. Um, so I have to hit you with this one. I, just, I feel like this is sort of like one of those um, commercials on TV from the pharma groups, you know. Do you suffer from overly mobile workforce? <laughs> Ask yourself. And then, you know, there's that big long thing. You know, aging, transitioning workforce, retirements, are folks going to be moving through your company at a rate that is too fast for you to manage? You know, we all know about mobility. We all have folks retiring. We all have turnover. But is this going to accelerate to the point that you can no longer manage it? Okay, and that's the issue. Okay, so I won't hit you anymore with the scary stuff. Um, so if you answered yes, join the club. And what was fascinating is that little quick poll about the number of folks who have some sort of succession plan or some sort of strategic workforce plan in place. Not a whole bunch of hands. Um, so there is something you can do about that. So if you're going to move forward, think in terms of some sort of strategic workforce action plan. The reason I went with that is because it comes out SWAP. So it's a nice little acronym. Okay. But remember, succession planning can be part of a strategic workforce action plan. These are all sort of, they fit into one another. And the, the danger here uh, that I want to go over just quickly before I move forward is um, that when I'm focusing on tools today and things that you can do, and these are very straightforward, I mean, uh, this is nothing too brilliant, um, uh, don't get lost in the fact that these are tools and these are tactical responses, but you don't, you, know, you don't lose sight of the fact that you're looking at some sort of strategic response to these issues. Um, one quick point. Often when I talk with people about succession planning, um, what comes to mind is, how do I make sure Junior becomes the CEO of the company? You know? So I tend to not think in terms of leadership and leadership planning, um, in terms of the traditional leadership planning. Whoops, how'd that happen? Where'd that go? Do you think you can help me with that one? Yeah. Okay, so as I'm moving forward, Hilarious cartoon, of course, it goes right off the screen. Um, the, uh, essentially, you know, when I, when I typed in cartoons for succession planning, it was fascinating. There was the, one of these days, son, this is all going to be yours. Or one of these days, son, this could be yours over my dead body. Um, and what was interesting is there was only one cartoon that said, one of these days, daughter, uh, this is all going to be yours. Can you go up to the presentation on the top left, way up, up above the strip? Can I leave that one for you? Sweet. You might want to look away because you're going to get vertigo because this is going to move. Just so you know, this software is called Prezi. It's really nice. It's a 3D whiteboard into which you can just start dropping videos, um, pictures and the like, trying to stay away from PowerPoint. I'm not a very linear person, so you can see I'm just moving my way through. Here we go. As I said, look away or else you might get sick. Um, there. There. So what succession planning is not. It's not focusing on how do you make sure that your top level folks get, you know, that, that in some way you're identifying, you're getting bench strength, you're identifying folks within the organization or bringing folks from without to help um, with your group. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. And I think part, the, one of the points I want to make is 
in this new workplace where you're looking at a workforce that is very much what, do you, what have you done for me recently, how do you engage them, how do you make sure that they're moving forward, they're not as interested in hierarchy, they're not interested in loyalty and staying for extended periods, you need to think in terms of succession planning being throughout the entire organization, um, especially when you're looking at you know, on the, on the macro level, 168 million jobs that are going to be out there by about 2020, um, and you're going to have about, have about 158 million workers. So you're looking at a gap, an absolute gap of 10 million folks. You know, that's a lot of the, the, the stats I've seen. And then also you're looking at the folks who are coming into the workplace might not have all the skill sets of the people they're replacing. So um, you're needing to think in terms of throughout the entire organization. So, by the way, the four rights of succession planning with the success being emphasized there, that's Multnomah County, so I have to let them uh, give that um, uh, sort of uh, acknowledgement. Uh, so anyway, so when you're looking at um, succession planning, very simple idea, um, you know, right people, right number, right place, and right time. Um, and one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is a lot of these times you're looking at skill sets that are not going to be, if you can't find it, um, you might need to develop it. And if you need to develop it, it might be, uh, you know, a two-year, three-year, five-year timeline. So a lot of this is essentially folks need to start, as, as a region, we need to start thinking about this at, the, at, you know, at the macro level, at the micro level, and get going so that we're not looking at absolute gaps and we're not looking at, you know, orders unfulfilled, um, contracts not won, et cetera, because we didn't have the talent in place to do that. So um, this is another slide I got from Multnomah County, and, and this, the, the, the stress here is we're looking at the ability to use adaptive strategies um, and not technical strategies to, to solve this problem. And the reason I'm making this distinction is, you know, under a te uh, technical situation, you're looking at what folks know how to do now and what exists. Um, the adaptive strategy means we have to think in new ways. We have to learn new ways to solve problems. We're looking at problems that we've never had to deal with before in terms of the speed at which folks are moving in and out of organizations, new expectations and the like. Um, and that means that we need to, as much as possible, and you've heard this over and over again, engage folks in this problem solving. It's not sort of the technocratic response. It's not the experts who come in and solve this problem. It's essentially how do you engage folks at an organizational level to um, identify um, look at problems um, and identify solutions at their level so that they also buy into it because most of the folks who are doing the, the, this sort of analysis, they're the ones who are going to be implementing this um, at their level. It's no longer just sort of a, a top level idea. Um, once again, this idea of as you're moving throughout all these existing systems that exist already in place, you just need to new, think of new ways how to adapt them. You know, how are you doing your recruitment? How are you doing your, your, you know, your onboarding? How are you making sure that you, you can't tell someone, look, uh, 10 years from now, you might have the chance for a promotion. As we all know, those folks are gone. So how do you use these adaptive strategies within existing situations? Okay, enough of that. Just one quick point before I go on and start talking about the tools. Um, this is a wonderful word. First of all, it's the one word you can use if you're going to put together a limerick of, uh, with Schenectady, New York. Um, that, that's pronounced Synectity, okay? And that's essentially the word that means using a part to represent the whole. So, of course, um, the example um, I always like to do is, you know, when you're talking about head of cattle, you're not really talking about the head of cattle. You're talking about cattle cows, bulls, whatever it may be, steers. So the main point here is I'm going to be talking a lot about tools, but remember, the tools are just part of that entire whole. So we're focusing on this, but also just maintain that, that entire strategic perspective. Okay. Okay. Three possible solutions, just quickly. And they go in, you know, sort of ascending order in terms of complexity and usefulness. So, um, can folks see what that is? Does that make sense? It's a sledgehammer. So, that's what I refer to as the age audit, quick and dirty. Okay, that's a very simple solution when you're out there. Um, and we've already seen it, you've already done it here. So, just quickly, you know, it's something that you, if need be, you can go to see your HR folks box of chocolate helps, um, and ask them just to break down, do an age audit. How many folks are in the different cohorts, in the different decades? Um, and for example, this is one that we got to do, and I'm going to try an experiment here. Um, could you maybe scroll up? If you do a scroll up, it actually can bring me in closer. Okay, thank you. That's great. This is um, a company here in the Northwest um, where we did a very easy age audit. Um, and they came up with these numbers. And what was fascinating about it is they went out and they did the age audit. 
then of course their question was, okay, is that good? Um, you know, if you look at it, in many ways it reflects um, the reality that's out there. So um, surprise, surprise, a lot of boomers um, in there. Um, not many folks who are following up behind them. Uh, you could say that perhaps this is a company that needs to think in terms of uh, maybe pipelines. Uh, how do you, how, when these folks who are perhaps 10 years from retirement, how do you think about um, replacing them? Can you replace them? Are there skill sets out there? Are you a company that can attract new talent, et cetera? So um, you know, what's, what's the advantage of this type of tool, very easy age audit, I mean, we did one right here, is um, you have some numbers. And folks like numbers. And it, it gives you that first sense of maybe, you know, what are you going to do and how do you do it? Um, you know, and, and just simple questions. Um, the one that is important, I think is becoming more important these days, was, you know, often when I uh, ask people, you know, um, what are you looking at in terms of age? And folks are going, oh, yeah, um, Multnomah County. 31% uh, of their workforce can retire today if they want to. So you're looking at 30 of your folks, or 30% of your folks walking out the door if they want to. Of course, the question is, and everyone was kind of smug, we were all saying, well, but they won't, because they can't, because they can't afford to, um, because they're job locked. Uh, they lost all the, you know, their house values went, their, you know, their 401k went away or half away. Um, you know, folks are not in a position to be able to leave, so we're not going to worry about it. Well, guess what? That was going up. Um, more jobs in place, people are feeling a little bit more confident, housing values are going up, so maybe more folks can retire, and they're going to, you know, so that's something you need to think about. And also, just these questions, which, you know, Stacy's already asked them, so this is, this is great, it's like, you know, how are we going to hold on to the millennials? You know, if they're going to walk um, every time that they don't get the answer, what are we going to do about that? Um, you know, if you don't praise them for showing up on work that, today, uh, anyway, that's just my pet beef. Um, anyway, so, you know, how are you going to work on that one? I'm a boomer. What can I say? You know. Anyway, so very quick and dirty. The, you know, the advantage of this one um, is that obviously it's low cost, no cost. Um, if you're say uh, you've come from this this meeting, you're saying, "Oh my gosh, this is scary. Um, this is almost becoming a hair on fire issue." Um, yet you're the only person who showed up at this meeting, um, and the rest of the folks within your organization might not yet be motivated to do anything about this um, because they've got to meet quarterly targets. Um, you know, maybe if you just do this, it's it's sort of a guerrilla activity. Um, you can have something in hand and you can just say, "Oh, by the way, Bob, John." Amy, whatever it is, did you know that this is what our workforce looks like? Most folks have it back here. They have it at sort of an implicit level. But if you can bring it forward and just with no cost, just say, yeah, this is a, uh, yeah, oh boy, I didn't realize that this many of our people are, have the potential to walk or, or five years from walking, maybe we can do something about this. So, you know, as I said, if you need to start off, there's no one else in your organization, quick age audit takes care of it. Your HR people, they don't mind too much. They have all that data already in place, we hope. Um, and then you can move forward. Um, is this a success? Do you think you can get to action on this one? Yeah, and most likely not enough. Um, it might be enough to start scaring some folks. You know, maybe your 10% of your folks who are innovative are going to start being willing to move on, but maybe not much more than that. So you might be able to start getting some people to say, okay, maybe we need to look into this. Maybe we need to create a task force. Um, maybe we need to send some folks off to some conferences, um, sit in on more of these multi-generational pre presentations and think about it. You know, but it might not necessarily get you to yes, but if you do, you got a great company, start your swap. If no, maybe you can borrow from uh, something that the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority did a couple years back um, and is a little bit more uh, interesting, you're engaging folks more, you're gathering information, but you're also having to make sure that um, it's a good way to, uh, to gauge what type of trust you have within your organization. And so anyway, this three slightly more complicated um, rubrics. Can folks read that or do we need to zoom in on that? Could, could you, oh, I'm sorry? Zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay. Um, you need to create two rubrics. Okay, one is essentially like a Likert scale, one to five. How many? How long till retirement? You know, uh, the the ones that TVA did was less than one year. That's a one. You know, one year. To, I mean, that's a five. Excuse me. Five is quick, and then a one is more than five years. So that was the scale they used. Okay, one to five. Um, and then the second uh, rubric 
is that's where the interviewing starts. And that's where essentially you have to start going to your leads, your supervisors, your managers, whomever, whatever unit, you know, however your organizations broke down, and you start having this conversation with your folks, which is essentially, okay, who within your unit is really, say, on a five-point scale, essential or critical or very important, important, et cetera, okay? It's sort of the old rank and spank idea. You know, you rank them and you just figure out who's the most essential, who's the most critical to my organization. And you assign that, those folks fives. Then you work down to fours and threes and twos and ones. A quick aside, a colleague of mine said, you know, by the way, make sure folks are discreet about this because don't leave those uh, rankings out there because they're kind of a bummer when it comes to morale. So apparently, you know, all rules are, are based in bad experiences. So if you're doing this, make sure you've got your own secret drive. Um, and this is de dealt with with the usual, you know, finesse and subtlety that one needs and uh, sort of sensitivity one needs around the situation. Because the advantage of this one is, you know, it's always powerful. Um, you know, you interview your people and you go through this process. And um, the powerful bit about this is that, and could you zoom in on this one too, please, is, you know, you've got a simple ranking system. And once again, it's not a huge investment, but it's enough to start folks getting from imponderable to maybe we can identify what the issues are and we can start prioritizing, you know. Um, I have no idea why the name Paul's at the bottom with one for importance and one for uh, length of retirement. It's a little depressing, but anyway, I think that's just a, that was a mistake. But, you know, I mean, it just allows you to start um, magnifying in terms of how quickly are folks going to be leaving this organization and then also how important folks are. Um, and the reason why I also say this can also partially be viewed as some of a, a way of sort of gauging the, the temperature of your organization is because you're starting to get into sensitive questions here. Because, of course, if your supervisor walks around and says, oh, by the way, Paul, when are you going to retire? Um, you know, that is not, uh, that is freighted with all sorts of uh, concerns and issues about, oh, why do you ask me that question? Um, evaluations are coming up. Uh, you know, I mean, so, so there has, you know, this is one way, obviously, in which you can start gauging how healthy the organization is, how much trust there is, um, and are you in a position to perhaps even move forward on this type of issue? Because there, there are a lot of, as you're thinking about these types of situations, there's a lot of sensitivity around it. Um, obviously, um, importance to the organization, huge. Uh, don't, leave your, don't leave your scores around. But also, once again, if folks really aren't willing to share that type of information, that also can be an indicator that, wow, uh, maybe there are other issues we have to deal with that are even more important than succession planning and strategic you know, workforce planning. Maybe we need to start doing some team building, trust building, et cetera, figure out what the problem is. Um, so, um, and as I said, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority used this. It helped them to start thinking in terms of where are we gonna start putting our resources? What type of resource are we gonna put into succession planning? What are we gonna put into recruitment? What do we want to start putting into things like supply chain management, for lack of a better term, in ter working with the educational system? Because what happened is they started identifying skill sets that were missing, and missing in large numbers, and they started saying, you know, really our educational system should be able to provide, be able to produce folks who have these skill sets, and they then started, in turn, putting pressure on um, their educational systems. Um, a local example here is when you think about what Intel has done. You know, they've done a lot of supply chain management with the educational systems. You know, they, they let the universities know, they let the colleges know, this is what we need. They'll put resources behind it to make sure that then folks start getting that type of training, supply chain management. Something that, as an aside, community colleges are always interested in getting uh, feedback from employers about what is it you need. What do you need next year, three years, five years from now? Anyway, that's part of that larger conversation of the declaration of war. What do we do about this? So anyway, uh, you know, if you go through the results, I don't want to belabor this too much, but you know, this type of information can actually perhaps start convincing folks. You can start coming at this out of a task force type situation, and you can start getting to action. Um, you know, always important for C-suite folks. As you know, got to have numbers. Um, if you're looking at your CFO, you got to make sure that you can talk, think in some sort of terms of ROI. Um, you know, if we don't do this, we're going to start losing orders. We can't fulfill them. Um, we don't have folks who are, you know, we don't have mill rights. Uh, you know, our machinery is going to start going down. Um, there's a fascinating example of someone from the food processing um, industry who is a millwright, and no one can replace him because he's worked on a machine that no one else knows. 
Um, he's retired, but he gets called back on a consulting basis at about 250 bucks an hour. Um, he's happy. Um, that's obviously not something that's going to work very well. Um, I'm talking with a lot of folks in the, uh, in the health information technology uh, realm right now, and they're starting to get into bidding wars. And you know, believe it or not, healthcare providers don't have huge margins. Um, and if they're starting to pay really top dollar to get programmers in and folks who can help with rollouts, because um, there's all sorts of change going there, they're gonna st that's going to start being ruinous. So this, you know, it's coming. Um, don't want to do too much chicken little, but um, you know, this is a situation that's going to manifest itself pretty quickly. So success, um, you know, this has this type of activity has actually led to action and has caused people to say, okay, we need to go forward and do something about that. So, you know, not to be too cute, um, if it works out, you can start thinking in terms of moving forward on a strategic plan. Uh, final point, third level of, of uh, sort of uh, complexity and thinking more in terms of this strategic approach is um, being able to do some sort of vulnerability assessment and doing some sort of key person network analysis. Once again, it's the same idea, um, a little bit more complex and thinking a little bit more in a more sophisticated manner in terms of networks and networks of influence. Um, who in your company is the go-to person? Who in your company is the know-how person? Um, and what is it that makes them that way? And then what kind of networks have they established? And part of this is also this ability to deal with, as you're looking at folks walking out the door, are you going to leave them? walk out the door with everything they know, or are you going to have some sort of knowledge management system in place that allows you to capture all this stuff? Um, and I don't think I can get closer on that one, but could you, could you pull that one up? Thanks. So um, in this idea, you can build on what you've done with your criticality um, table that you put together before. You know, you're looking at those 25s, the 20 to 25 group, you know, anything in terms of action. Um, and then you can start digging a little bit deeper. and then. Once again, you ask, you go back to your folks and say, okay, who really can we not afford to lose? Say within your unit, you know, who is your most important person? And then you start going through this exercise of asking these folks, okay, what is it that you know that makes you, you know, you're, I've been told you're really important. What is it that makes you really important? Um, obviously, you're asking you know, a little bit more subtle perspective and it's a little bit more positive. You know, appreciative inquiry works really well here. In other words, catching people doing things right. Um, and this can be part of your strategic plan because if you start thinking in terms of, okay, there's a lot of people in our organization who do things really well. How can we catch them doing it well and how can we capture what they do so that it doesn't go away when they do? So, you know, simple questions like, okay, what is it you know? Okay, and there's obviously there's those two types of knowledge. There's that stuff book knowledge and, and you know, my credentials that gave me the knowledge and the accounting and everything. But then there's also that tacit knowledge. Some folks call it tribal. Um, try to stay away from that one. But you know, essentially it's that sense of um, I never learned this in school. I only learned it on the job and I only learned it on this job and I only learned it through a lot of blood, sweat and tears. And you know, those are the folks who, like in academic um, departments, it's usually that department secretary runs the entire university. I mean, if you, bring, if you get rid of all your department secretaries, the university sh stops. Professors don't know what's going on. Forgive me, the deans don't know, really know what's going on from an operational perspective. It's, it's those department secretaries. They run everything. They've got all the power and they know what's going on. Um, that type of idea. Um, who do they know? If you call them and say, you know, really, I need this piece of paper signed by tomorrow. Um, and usually it takes six weeks. You give it to that person, they make it happen. It's that type of situation. The, the, the networks, the folks who know how to solve those problems, that's been built up over time. They have the connections within the organization, but also, more importantly, they've also got those connections outside the organization. You know, what is that information that you have? And as you're starting to talk about that and ask people about that, um, you can start building, and if you could, you, could you come up with this one, and you start mapping these key person networks Okay, sounds fancy. But essentially, um, you know, and, and the point um, here that we're trying to make is, so, so for example, if you have someone who's low down in your hierarchy, right, and that, that red box on the bottom, you know, if you pull them up and get away from this sort of orga or organizational chart, you know, sort of the technical hierarchical perspective, and you start saying, okay, who are your networks? You know, you are essential to the operations. Who do you know inside the organization and outside the organization? You start mapping this. Um, and then you start creating key person networks with your most important people, you start being able to get a sense of, okay, what is it that makes the organization run? 
what is the knowledge I need to capture, whose knowledge do I need to capture, and what do I need to do about that. You know, for example, if most of your knowledge that's really important is really tacit knowledge, that has an influence on what your strategic workforce plan should be. That means you're, you're going to be doing a lot of downloads with these people. You need to set up some sort of system where you have them mentor people. Um, you change your job responsibilities so that, you know, 10 hours a week, they're just downloading what they know. Um, they're getting on some so sort of simple mind mapping software like this, and they're just starting to capture that. And these are the folks I know, and this is why I know them, and this is why it's important. Because, you know, a lot of companies grow up, and they have a lot of informal processes in place. And if you start walking, and if you start training people up, and then they walk, your efficiency goes away. You know, what's the old thing? We, can, we no longer know how to land on the moon. We would have to relearn how to do it, because all that knowledge walked out. You know, you know first-generation heads-up display for uh, pilots. We don't know how to do that anymore. We're on third generation. We don't know how to do the first. It's that idea of how do you hold on to knowledge that you need for your operations. That's essential. Anyway, so building this type of thing, um, if you could pull that up again. I'm learning. This didn't make these big enough. Um, you know, you start figuring out where you need to go. Are you, is your, a knowledge that is strong on um, SOPs? Um, if not, you need to start thinking in those terms. I'm about to get yanked. So just quickly, um, we've covered most of the points. Um, and just so you know, uh, I sort of under-promised. I said I'd take, give you two take-home points. Well, actually, there's three now. One, boom retirements, worker mobility, it's a threat. It's soon going to be a threat. Folks need to think in terms of how do I create that vulnerability assessment of the threat. Two, organizations that see it coming and react strategically they're going to be the ones, they're going to be the employer of choice. I loved hearing that out here because that's a point I'm trying to make with folks is you need to be the employer of choice because it's soon going to be a seller's market. Okay. Third, no matter how you read it, time to act. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>